Hello, everyone. Troy Eckert here with Eckert Enterprises in uh, Allen, Texas. And I just want to give you a little bit of introduction to our guest today. Uh, I have with me Brandon Moncrief. He is with McLaren and Associates, which is a DSO specialized firm looking at dental practices and how to best serve that particular uh, occupation and that profession. Brandon, tell us a little bit about your firm and about yourself and just let the audience know a little bit about what you do. Yeah, Troy, thanks for having me. It's great to see you. So I'm Brandon Moncrief, Principal CEO of McLaren & Associates. We're based in Austin, Texas, but we serve dentists and dental specialists nationwide. Our firm specializes in providing valuation services and sell-side representation for large practice owners who are looking at pursuing a DSO affiliation or private equity partner. Our company's been around 35 years. Uh, based in Austin, we have a team of 12 that serve our clients nationally. We have an office in San Diego, an office in Atlanta as well. And we've been actively doing both doctor to doctor and DSO, private equity practice sales, uh, for three decades. And we've sold over a thousand practices, closed over 1.2 billion in transaction volume. So all day long, I like to say we're educating and empowering dentists to make good decisions with their practice from a financial and emotional and professional perspective. Well, I, I will tell you, uh, Brandon, I have been around in investments since 1985. And really in my business, this whole DSO, doctor to doctor, the, the selling of dental practices and the private equity involvement, really is something I've been aware of only like the last four or five years. So to me, you've been doing it a long time. Your firm's been around a long time. It's like, this is like a hidden sector of asset transactions that's going on that most investors, especially probably even a lot of existing uh, individuals in the medical profession are unaware of. So what started this whole DSO, this, this acquisition, doctor, doctor, private equity kind of uh, format? What, what changed the market? Yeah, so for about the first 30 years of our firm, we really focused on the more traditional type of practice sale. An individual doctor selling to another doctor, you know, practices being valued at 70 to 80 percent of annual revenue. And about five to six years ago, we noticed a marked change. And that was private equity's entrance into the dental industry. And being based in Texas, that was one of the first markets that began to consolidate. So we quickly realized that once private equity comes into an industry and starts to invest, they're in it long term. And, and they're going to spend a lot of money, throw a lot of assets at it, and consolidate that marketplace as fast as they possibly can. And we started seeing some of our larger potential clients go the DSO route, many of them starting you know, selling heart to Heartland Dental. They were kind of the, the first girl at the dance that was private equity backed. And they grew very, very quickly uh, five to 10 years ago. And then we saw other private equity, other DSOs come into the marketplace and start to mimic their model and begin to buy practices. And the reason being is private equity looks for industries that are highly profitable, highly stable, and highly fragmented. They can benefit from centralizing the operational administrative functions of the business, and they can benefit from leveraging economies of scale, from leveraging vendors for better pricing. You know, DSOs, private equity can buy equipment and supplies for half of what private practitioners pay. And they can leverage payers for better reimbursement rates. We've seen a lot of PPO infiltration in this industry over the past 15 years. And leveraging those economies of scale can allow you to get better reimbursement rates. Private equity was super interested in dentistry going into COVID. Uh, we had about 200 DSOs operating nationally. And then when dentistry proved to once again be recession proof, now pandemic proof, and rebound as fast or faster than any other medical vertical, private equity doubled down. Those mm -hmm. private equity firms, those DSOs that were already in the space began to invest to consolidate and aggregate practices at an even faster clip at higher valuations. And then we had many more private equity firms that were eyeing dentistry pre-COVID make, make an investment and begin to build a DSO. So now we've got over 500 DSOs operating nationally. And uh, yeah, I mean, demand over the past two years has been sky high and valuations have been at an all time high. So I, I would take it from my experience with private equity, at least over 40 years of being in the invest world, typically private equity is known for buying great businesses and destroying them. <laughs> um, so what I've heard from my own partners who've sold to DSOs or affiliated with DSOs who've gone through that experience, it seems like, and from what you're saying, they not only have decided this is a great space to be in, 
but apparently they've come with a great management strategy and consolidation, aggregation, vendor services, et cetera. But it's like a, a virtual back office, but they do it for multiple offices, which means less personnel, better cost savings. There. So it sounds like they've mastered this. They really like it, but I had no idea there was 500 DSO. That is enormous amount of exposure in the market for dentists who want to look at selling their practice today. Yeah, it is. And this version of DSOs and private equity's involvement in the space, I'll call as version 2.0. Back in the 80s and 90s, there were some private equity firms and institutional investors that began to build DSOs really before DSOs were a thing. And they looked at it as, hey, we're going to capture all the financial arbitrage. We know how to run these businesses better than the dentists do. We're going to come in, buy them, start them, treat the dentist not as a partner, but just as a W-2 employee. And we're going to show them how to make money doing dentistry. And yeah. that failed miserably. So imagine. the private equity firms that are investing today, the DSOs that exist today, those that acquire practices, not those that have a de novo model and only start practices, but those that acquire practices are focused on buying quality assets, partnering with great doctors and trying to stay out of their way and not screw it up and allow the doctors to invest alongside the private equity firm retain or roll some equity and participate in that financial arbitrage that they're generating. That opportunity was not available in version DSO 1.0, but in today's environment, DSOs have learned to stay in their lane. They've learned to support the doctor behind the veil. It's not patient facing. They don't rebrand offices and just support them from an administrative operational perspective, from a capital perspective and stay out of the operatory and not interrupt their, their clinical autonomy. So that's been a marked change. And that's the reason why, you know, DSO is really no longer a four letter word as it was to most of my clients up until about five years ago. Yeah, that's kind of what I'd heard too, that, that a lot of people are not pleased with it, but that seems to have changed. So, you know, as I told you before we started this, I like to go off script a little bit. So I got to ask questions because I'm talking to so many of my clients that are dentists that have either looking to sell their practice or they've already sold their practice. And that is, when when you look at a, D, a DSO kind of a scenario, is it because the dentist is saying, I need to find a point to take some chips off the table, or I've matured my practice to the point that myself, with my team, there's only so many hours a day I can work, so I, I know I'm limited in growth, I have chips on the table, and I don't want to work myself into a, into a corner, so they're saying, I, I want to transition, I want to take some chips off the table, but gosh, maybe this firm can help me grow my business. I can participate in some of that growth, but also be less exposed. Is that kind of the combination that they're looking at? Or There's a lot of different reasons why people choose to go down the DSO path. And the first question I always ask doctors in a discovery call where we're meeting each other for the first time is, you know, tell me what, what's your why, right? What are you looking to accomplish? What are your goals? And that can vary from doctor to doctor, from practice to practice. So for some doctors that are later in their career, they're looking for an exit plan, right? They're, they're trying to lock in an exit strategy. They may want to monetize the business, but continue to work in it until they're ready to retire. For a lot of doctors, it's about protecting that nest egg. You know, they've got a lot of net worth tied up in their business. They want to unlock that capital and invest it and protect it. Um, other doctors are looking for operational administrative support. I will say the age of our dentist has gotten younger and younger as far as sellers are concerned. I mean, average age of client five years ago was probably around 60 to 65. Average age today is around 45 to 50. And mm -hmm. I think that's a product of the fact that a lot of younger entrepreneurial dentists have built big multi-doc, multi-million dollar offices, and they've missed a lot of their personal life, their, their kid's life has come at a huge sacrifice. And they're under a tremendous amount of stress on a daily basis managing a large business. So they can benefit not only from taking some chips off the table and investing it and in earning compound interest on, on that investment over time, but also delineate some of the admin, admin and operational responsibilities to a DSO partner and free up more of their personal time to focus on their family and focus on their passions, focus on hobbies, and also to free up bandwidth to continue to grow the business. You know, many owners are so knee deep in the administrative part of the business and still working clinically chair side, they don't have time to focus on growth. So it's actually holding the business back by not having somebody that's there to support them on the daily from an operational administrative perspective. So whether it's growth focused, 
whether it's financial focused, whether it's quality of life focused, there's many reasons that dentists choose to go down this road. Yeah, one of the things I've heard from several of our clients is that, you know, they were looking for an exit, but they wanted to have somewhere to go with the money in order to be able to, you know, give up that income from the practice, but feel like they could put the proceeds from a sale to work for them. And that's kind of where our business came into hand. But what do you think is the biggest uh, holdback? Let's say you you talk to five or six potential sellers and they're just struggling with the idea of finally listing it. Is it is it that they built their practice and it's their baby? Are they afraid of giving up that income? Is it afraid of like, what the heck am I going to do now with my time? Or what am I going to invest the money in? Is, what's the biggest obstacle you think right now that mindset wise, these, these dentists are reluctant to sell or, or delaying selling? I think there's there's a few obstacles that most dentists like struggle with as they contemplate should I sell now? Should I wait? Should I go down the DSO road or should I go down, you know, more of a traditional path? You know, part of it's certainly emotional. You know, a lot of our clients have a big part of their identity tied up in their practice and, you know, handing it over, uh, whether in full or in part to a DSO can, you know, be a little scary. Um, from an economic perspective for younger doctors, they're evaluating, you know, the longer my runway if I sell a big piece of the business and give up that ongoing income stream, is it going to be worth it? Does it make financial sense to sell now and monetize 60, 70, 80% of the business if I'm still planning to be here for another 10 or 20 years? So the longer the runway, the more we have to explore not just the economics, but also the other elements of the why. You know, are you doing this for work-life balance? Are you doing it to get help from an operational administrative perspective? Do you want to continue to scale the business? And you want somebody that's got resources that they can bring to bear to help the business to go to the next level. Um, and then there's some, some caution right now about deal structure, right? So I'm going to take 60 to 80% cash at close. And then the remainder is going to be in some form of equity, either retained equity at the practice level or rolling proceeds into stock in the DSO's holding company. And, you know, what is that equity worth? How do I know that I'm buying it for a fair price? What are my rights as far as liquidating that equity in the future? When is that going to occur and what the, is the return going to look like? So there's a, a natural amount of caution and, and fear for a lot of doctors when they enter into this process. And that's why we always start with understanding the why, doing evaluation, doing an EBIT analysis, quantifying the economic implications and talking about the different deal structures available, what they're looking to accomplish and make sure that that's a fit for what the market can provide before we ever look at selling a practice or affiliating with a DSO. What kind of market size are we talking about? If you got 500 DSOs, how many dentist practices are there in the US? A lot. There's over 150,000 dental practices in the US. Um, so that's a lot. Yeah. So I, a lot of people say that the industry is, you know, 20, 30, 40% consolidated. The reality is that nobody has a really good figure as far as how consolidated the industry is. I think we're only probably in the third or, or inning of the, the private equity back consolidation of the industry. I think yeah. we're going to see this continue to transform our industry for another five to 10 years. You know, what the future will look like then, hard to say, but private equity DSOs are not going anywhere. I heard uh, in the last nine or 10 months, because I've got a lot of good friends that, that have become partners, investors with my firm, uh, buying, you know, mineral rights and what have you, but they've given me a lot of reconnaissance, both, both pre-sale to a DSO and after the sale. And I think one of the things they were looking at is um, it seemed like the market got a little softer the last, you know, 12 months, because I guess the economy was slowing down, things are getting tighter. Um, has the last 12 months with inflation kind of hurt the valuations from somebody wanting to sell to a DSO or is that kind of rebound or where are we at in that, you know, that top of the market versus current condition kind of status at this point? Yeah, that's a great question. So no doubt we've entered a little bit of a different climate, right? You know, macroeconomically, there's a lot going on. Potential recession. I feel like I've been saying that for, you know, five years, but we definitely have elevated interest rates and we have constrained capital markets. And the vast majority of these DSOs are fueled by private equity, which is fueled by leverage, by bank debt, and typically short-term bank debt, which is most impacted by you know, an elevated you know, interest rate environment. So at the current time, 
you've got some DSOs that are on the sidelines that are not buying practices. They either don't have capital or they're over their skis operationally. They grew too quick. And now they need to build the infrastructure, build the administrative support in order to actually integrate and support the businesses that they've acquired. So, you know, maybe a third of the market, the third of the buyers in the market are more of in a holding pattern. Um, but the two thirds of the market that are buying are still being very aggressive. And we've seen a lot of smaller emerging DSOs over the past year or two take on private equity capital, and they're still flush with cash and have plenty of access to leverage. So those younger emerging DSOs have kind of stepped up to fill the void that the third of the marketplace that's on hold has left. The We really expected 2023 to be a tough year for, for our business, for valuations, but we have not seen that. You know, valuations ripped coming out of COVID. I mean, practices that were selling for five to six times EBITDA pre-COVID, post-COVID selling for seven to eight times EBITDA. And valuations have really remained at an all-time high over the past couple of years. The market softened a little bit, but we haven't seen valuations come down remarkably. I will say that, you know, a practice where we may have had 10 or 15 offers three, six months ago, now we're seeing, you know, maybe five to seven offers. So you don't have quite as much optionality, but the valuations have held pretty strong. And we're hoping that that's going to continue for the foreseeable future and that the macroeconomic environment we're in is hopefully going to be short lived. We're probably going to see, you know, one or two more quarter point rate increases. And then second half of last year, especially in election cycle, I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see rates, you know, at least plateau, if not decline and the capital markets start to ease up. And this marketplace, the DSO marketplace, begin to rip again, kind of with a post COVID impact. What's your what's your sweet spot? What kind of practice is a sweet spot for these DSOs? A five, 10, 15 million dollar practice, a one man show, multi office. I mean, like on a on a dartboard, if it were the bullseye, what's the ideal acquisition for a DSO? At a minimum, you're talking revenue around 1.5 million, an EBITDA around 300 thousand. That's typically a one, you know, maybe two doctor practice with five to eight operatories. The practices that we currently see the most demand for are multi-doctor practices within 60 to 90 miles of a major metro area, you know, eight plus operatories, revenue of 3 million plus and EBITDA of a million plus. That's what all DSOs are really looking for. And that's where you see the highest multiples. And then, you know, we go all the way up to the 10, 20 location practice with, you know, 20 to 40 million in revenue and anywhere from four to 10 million in EBITDA. Um, those are what we refer to as platform investments. You see less bidders for those practices today than you did previously, just because a transaction of that size requires more leverage and the capital markets are you know, tight. So access to that kind of leverage is harder to find today than it was a year or two ago. So you've seen some compression in the multiples and compression in demand on the top, top end of the market. You've seen less demand for smaller practices with revenue of 1.5 million or less, EBITDA of under 300,000. But that 300,000 in EBITDA up to about, you know, 5 million in EBITDA, sky high demand, strong valuations, you know, as we sit today. They don't want to eat a bull elephant. They're not into squirrels. They want an Impala, something in the middle that's nice and running, lean and mean, but they can make some growth out of it. When you think about the market right now, um, what could be the derailment of the DSO appetite going forward in the next 12 or 20 months. Too high a cost of capital, interest rates don't come down, inflation digs in, it's, it gets worse instead of better, and all of a sudden capital gets even tighter or more expensive, and that just pushes down values, and dentists say, I'll hold, I, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. But what do you think? Is that, that going to be the downside of, of DSOs maybe slowing down? Yeah, I, I definitely think, so we're at an inflection point right now in, in two ways. So from a, a capital perspective and an interest rate perspective, if this is not temporary, if you know we move into a, a longer period of time, 24, 36 months where interest rates are elevated and capital markets are tight, that's going to put most private equity backed companies, not just DSOs, this isn't unique to the dental space. It's going to put most private equity backed companies under a serious amount of pressure. So I think that's you know one major risk. Uh, and then if as a result, valuations come down, you know, a lot of our clients are not super compelled to sell, right? They'll sell for the right price at the right time, 
But if valuations come down, you know, a turn or two on the EBITDA multiple, there will be doctors that maybe were sellers in a different environment that are not sellers in that environment. So a lack of supply combined with a lack of demand, you know, could result in the marketplace slowing down considerably. I think the other thing is, is kind of being solved for right now. And that is from an operational perspective. You know, I mentioned it earlier, a lot of DSOs grew too quickly. They got out over their skis operationally. They were just aggregating practices as fast as they can and not really integrating and operating them. Now the institutional investors on the back end that buy these DSOs at Recap are really paying attention to, great, you could buy these assets at an incredible pace, but are you making the practices that you acquire better? What does your yeah. same store sales growth look like? So from an operational perspective, DSOs are really, really having to get their shop in order in order to be attractive on the back end when they go to recap. Um, so I think that that's been good for the industry. I think long term, that is going to be very, very good for DSOs and, and the dental industry as a whole. So I, I'm, I'm happy that, you know, while the market's tightened a little bit as a result of that, I, I think it's a positive thing long term for our industry that DSOs are are going through that that inflection point and having to focus on making sure that they're operationally sound. Yeah, it wouldn't hurt in, in my view from an investment perspective. You know, you have 500 DSOs because it turned out to be a great asset class, very rewarding financially, very high rates of return, et cetera. But, you know, little uh, hiccups like raising uh, inflation rates and cost of capital and uh, lack of liquidity really does a lot to trim the fat. You might lose 50 or 100 DSOs because they just can't go get the capital. They can't cut the mustard. They don't have the back office or systems are failing. Well, that's kind of a good thing because it cleans out the garage and allows everybody to get a more lean, more efficient system, which happens in oil and gas all the time. You know, we're seeing Exxon buy out this company. So we see fewer and fewer players, but the ones that are left are better, more efficient, more profitable. So it, it does become a skinnier market in terms of volume but it turns out to be a more efficient market because of those consolidated back office operations, et cetera. You know, so that works out pretty good. Um, I guess I have one more question for you. So right now today, um, what we have had some of our partners who are dentists, what they were always struggling with is, well, what do I do with the money? So now that I've sold, where the heck do I go with the cash? Because stock market's down 500 points today. Uh, crypto's all over the board. Everybody's scared to death of banks because of the consolidation there and the problems that SBB had, et cetera. So, I know for myself, I get asked all the time to, to buy certain businesses that I have. And I'm always like, well, what the heck am I going to do with the money? Where am I going to go if I'm making this kind of return? So one, what kind of return does the DSO look for? And if I'm a dentist and I'm making this kind of income, I got to say to myself, well, thanks for the eight or $9 million or $10 million. What, what am I going to go do with it? Right. And I'm assuming that's probably going to be what long-term capital gains when they sell or, or how is that treated when they sell? I guess there's a lot of tax planning behind that, but just out of curiosity, what's the DSO is looking for? And what the heck do these do these uh, sellers look to do with the money? Are they are they struggling to find places to park it? Yeah, I, you know, all of our clients are concerned about you know where is the best place to put the money when they take those chips off the table. And right now, people are you know a little bit confused, right? A lot of people are dumping a ton of money into T bills, you know, just because they're safe and they're paying a decent return. Uh, so figuring out where to put that money, and then also how to mitigate the taxes because you are looking at you know, most of it being taxed as a long-term capital gain, which, you know, is how you want it taxed. But the preference would be to obviously, you know, defer those taxes or mitigate those taxes if possible. Um, so that's a major, major consideration for all of our clients are the tax implications and, you know, where are they going to put the money? So, you know, I'd love to hear about why mineral rights are a great asset class for, for dentists to look at when they're looking to invest the proceeds from, these sales and what type of you know tax advantages those those investments offer. Yeah, that's a great question, and I, I know we're doing this to you know kind of bring out the benefits of both of our companies. But to be candid, we four years ago I didn't even think about dentists. I had no idea what was going on. All of a sudden, I ran across a couple of dentists. They said, "Hey, I just sold my practice. I'm looking for passive income." I said, "Well, we buy oil and gas mineral rights." They go, "Well, what's the, what's the benefit?" I said, "Well, you're buying true real estate." but it's under the ground, the natural resources. You have major oil companies that are developing your minerals, which is an Exxon, Oxy, Chevron, the big guys. And you get a royalty check every month for all the oil and gas they sold because it's your minerals they're developing and you get 12 and a half to 20% of all gross income. But here's the best part. You have no bills, no liability, no holding costs, no expenses, no exposure. And they're like, really? 
I said, well, if you're thinking about selling your practice, it's because you don't want employees, you don't want HR, you don't want headaches, you don't want lawsuits, you're trying to avoid that. And what better way to do it than invest in something that doesn't have anything like that attached to it? Um, so we were just in a great position after 40 years of having been on the side of developing and drilling. And when mineral rights became a really uh, available market about eight or nine years ago, it became a perfect investment for anybody, whether it be a dentist or a manufacturer or a lawyer saying, I just want to get away from this, this conglomerate that I built. I just want to go enjoy my life with my kids and grandkids and have somebody make me money. So that transition occurred. The tax advantages for mineral rights is not big because essentially you don't have losses. It's just all income. You'll get 15% of your income you don't pay taxes on because it's like depreciating equipment. You're depleting the reserve. So the IRS says, okay, 15% of your income you don't pay taxes on. The big tax write-off or advantage for somebody selling a practice comes when you participate in the drilling of the wells. And so you think about things like drilling costs and fluids and, and all that stuff. Well, I'm going to invest some money from my sale of my practice. I'm going to put it into so much in the drilling, so much in the minerals. I get tax deductions as I need them, according to my CPA. And now I created this nice 25 to 50 year cash flow by owning mineral rights. And all I have to do is watch my deposit 12 months a year. It's 12 distributions, a 1099, never have a bill, no expenses, no back ends, no fees. It's like, why the heck wasn't this around? I said, well, I wish I knew it was around 30 years ago too, but it wasn't. It's because of all the new technology. So this became very appealing to the dentist that we ran across that found us online. Next, you know, I'm being invited to all these dental groups and we go in like, I'm leaving tomorrow for another one. Like, hey, you got to talk to this guy because look what kind of returns he's getting and, and I have no capital exposure. So it kind of became that some of the folks like yourself and DSOs or what I, I don't know how to properly call it in your industry, brokers and people helping uh, different dentals were saying, Troy, you need to talk to these individuals because their biggest fear is what do I do with the money? How do I reduce the taxes? And how do I have a continual income every month that allows me to live my lifestyle? And it kind of turned out to be a perfect match. So we've we've had a really, really big group of dentists, that probably 350 to 400 dentists with our firm now. And they've all said the same thing. This is exactly what we were looking for. So it's been a great match. But again, it's it's something that most people are not aware of. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it makes a lot of sense, especially combined with what's happening in the space. And so many dentists are taking a significant amount of chips off the table. And, you know, they had a lot of their net worth tied up in the business. And now they've liquidated that and have the opportunity to invest it. And everybody wants to be diversified, right? Yeah. Um, you know, looking at what's going on with the stock market, you know, macroeconomically, I think putting your money in alternative investments and, you know, places that we know are safe and that are going to get a great return, you know, is smart business. Are there also some some tax deferral strategies, 1031 strategies that play into the, the mineral rights? Uh, yeah, that was the two, the two things, uh, uh, Randon, that a lot of the partners realize is that one, you can do 1031 exchanges when they sell their building or their practice. They can 1031 into minerals. It's a like kind exchange. You can go right back out of minerals in four or five years, right back into traditional real estate if you decide the market shifts. It's a fantastic tool that are being used right now. Plus, most of them didn't realize they could invest in their self-directed IRA, the retirement plan, which I didn't realize how much a lot of these dentists had accumulated inside of that self-directed IRA because of real estate investments, et cetera. So 75% of our funding has been through self-directed IRAs. We've done about $630 million in cash acquisitions the last 40 months. Uh, we're generating about a 17% cash on cash return across all of our portfolios. Um, we're the largest mineral buyer in the state of Oklahoma, and we have zero dry holes and over 5,000 wells generating income every day. And our, our, so we're so diversified. It's so low risk, high double digit returns. But most importantly is they're able to really manipulate and use tax advantages, 1031 exchanges by buying through their self-directed IRA. That IRA grows with that high cash flow without having to worry about any kind of losses inside that IRA. It, and then the other thing that's been really big, I should add this because I, I always forget to say this, but it's, it's something that uh, some of our smart engineering clients figured out is when they buy the minerals and they do it inside their IRA, they roll it from a traditional IRA to a Roth. But when you get that independent appraisal done, it takes like a 40 or 50 percent haircut. So they're able to roll from a traditional IRA into a Roth and take a major haircut, which means a lot less in taxes upon that roll. One of our engineers looked at it, found that independent appraiser, came back, said it's this thick. IRS is going to look at it and say it's absolutely compliant. We don't pitch that. But a lot of my clients use it. I said, man, y'all are smarter than I am. But thank God, because it's really become a very good tax tool uh, for everybody under that IRA and that conversion to the Roth. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. I would imagine the advancements in technology have made drilling, you know, and the probability of not hitting a dry hole 
you know, much, much lower. So it's much more predictable when you are, you know, developing minerals. It's just like a dental office today. I mean, I remember when I had my wisdom teeth taken out, I had a little short dentist. He gets on my chest, my tooth and laying sideways. He's I got this dentist crying, he's trying to crack it out. I'm thinking something's wrong with this picture. Now they're talking about all this equipment they have and software. They're literally drilling oil wells now with a computer looks like a video game. And they're controlling a drill bit four miles in ground using triangulation from satellites, drilling with micro inches. Exxon came out about two months ago and said with artificial intelligence, we can double our output or double our reserves because I don't have drunk hungover Willie at the rig. And tomorrow I got AI guiding the drill bit. And it's, you know, I can be can. I'm, I'm almost 60 years old. I started in 1985. I was back in the days when they were slinging chain and guys were losing fingers. And now it literally is this sophisticated drilling rig that walks with uh, its own feet. The rig moves over in six hours, doesn't take them three days. It's, it's nuts. But the key to this is because of the technology, the industry no longer talks about dry holes is what's your rate of return. And from your perspective and my perspective, now that this is a technology driven industry, uh, we created our own app called Eckerd Insights. And I'm always worried about Ponzi schemes and crooks and liars and cheats and thieves. And only gas is a very, very tough industry because it's complex. So I spent about $2 million and built our own app. Now, just like Robinhood or your stock account, you can get on your phone, pull up Eckerd Insights. You can pull up every well you own minerals in. You can pull up what they produce, when they were filed, the tax records, who bought it, uh, your revenue check. And everything now is done by satellite on the location out in the middle of Oklahoma, it goes up to satellite. People in Houston are getting the production. So this whole transparency has become paramount because investors are expecting a mainstream investment. Well, minerals, our company's brought that to the forefront. We're the only one that has this app. And what it's done is it's taken a sophisticated dentist, says, I'm going to sell my practice. But if I'm going to give you my life's earnings in this practice, I got to look at it every once in a while. I got to know my money's safe. So I said, we're going to spend the money and time and build the most modern app because why? That's what I would want. You're not taking my 30 year practice. Give me money. I'm going to give it some knucklehead in Dallas. And I have no way of tracking my investment. So we built this specifically for analytically sharp people who want to know about their investments. Because I said, you know what? If I show them and tell them, I have no concerns. And I think that's the way it has to be done in today's investment world. No, I absolutely love it. Just speaking personally, you know, I've pursued quite a few what I'll deem alternative investments. And with most of them, especially private equity, you know, backed, institutional backed, you know, alternative investments, there's just not a ton of transparency. There's not a clear line of sight, right, as to, you know, what's happening on a daily basis. So, yeah, kudos to you for developing that app. And, uh, you know, it's going to make the people invest with you feel much more comfortable and sleep better at night having that level of transparency. We've done, Brandon, to be candid, we've done such a good job, probably like your business with 35 years experience. I've been doing this for almost 38 years. And one of the things about it is that, you know, you know, you have the right product or the right reputation, like your firm, when you have people that are seeking you out, we're getting 40, 50 referrals a month. But more importantly is when you start looking at the way your business runs, you say, you know, I could really retire tomorrow and it doesn't change my company. I've got a great staff. When you put yourself in position of being non-critical, I think you kind of achieved a success in your business. And that's how I feel. Sometimes I'm looking around going, I don't know what to do today, you know, because I got such a great team. The app does it all. But the flip side of that is candidly, and, and I think you know this because you're you're definitely mature enough that you've seen this go around. The amount of scams, Ponzi schemes, ripoffs, it's really it's starting to bubble over right now because when you have a robust economy like you had the last 10 years with you know, an idiot could have made 30% of the stock market or real estate. Now all of a sudden all those deals are collapsing. You're starting to look around saying, you know, I need a little bit of wrinkles and some gray hair and some experience. I need to look at McLaren and go, they got 35 years of history. So if I'm going to trust somebody to buy side value my dental practice and represent me and fight for those dollars, I better go talk to Brandon and his team because I need every ounce of advantage I can get. And that's why, you know, I always say it's more about the person than than the, the actual transaction because you can lose on incompetency, on being crooked or being deliberately intentional uh, that's not in your favor. And, and that's really what's much, much most critical. Um, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add, but I got to tell you, I'm, I'm super impressed with what you said. I, I'm blown away by the DSO market. Though. I didn't know there was 500 in there. I'm thinking, wow, that's that's huge. I also think, candidly, um, talking to these dentists, I, I bet you there's a massive onslaught of willing participants in selling practices the next 10 years because I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. I don't want to make my living standing over somebody for the rest of my life. And I don't know what it is about dentists. Why are they all six foot two to eight foot tall? What the heck is that? Do you know I mean? 
<laughs> Maybe it was the yeah. van, but I walk into the room, I feel like a midget. I'm six foot tall. I'm like, what is with you, Dennis? You're all like seven foot tall. So I know there's going to be a lot of interest. I hope that uh, everybody who watched this, we've got about a 5,000 person database. We've got a lot of dentists we've run across. I'm definitely going to share it with those individuals. Say, look, you got to call Brandon up and talk about what they can do for it. Uh, we want to make sure that we're very much in line with helping you get those dentists to where they need to be because it is one of those things. A lifetime of work can disappear overnight for the wrong reason an accident, a heart attack, a, you know, whatever. And it really is something where they've got to take some serious approach. And I'm sure your firm is very, very well uh, suited to be able to help them walk through those questions and answers and find out whether it's right or not. But anything you'd like to do on a parting conversation? So if you have any dentists out there that are evaluating going down this road, you know, considering selling within the next five years, whether that's to a private buyer or a DSO or private equity, you know, we'd love to have a conversation and understand their why and and talk about, you know, is now the right time? What would their practice trade for in the open market if they decided to pull the trigger and, and go to market? Uh, we're all about education and empowering people to make good decisions. So we play the long game. It's all about, you know, selling your practice to the right type of buyer at the right time. Like, like you said, we've worked very, very hard to build a, a stellar reputation. Um, so I encourage people to look us up, look us up on Google, look us up online. And uh, please reach out if, if I can be a resource and uh, we'd love to have a conversation. Well, I will tell you, you're going to have to add to your little bottom questionnaire. And I was smiling because I was thinking about one of my partners. He's like 39 years old, sold his practice right after COVID at top of dollar. He's 39. I don't know what he sold it for. It's a ridiculous amount, right? I just want you got to put it your bottom line. Gamblers Anonymous because he's in Vegas like every other week. <laughs> I was with him three weeks ago, I go, you know, you got to get a job, man. He goes, why? I don't have to get a job. Said, you can't come to Vegas every other week. You'll be back to doing dental practice. No, I, I'm just doing this because I'm having a little fun. I go, you've been here every other week. You got to get some help. So you might have to add that in your your line of what what not to do when you sell your practice. Um, I will definitely get this out to all of our clients. I All the dentists to run across, I'll send them your direction because quite frankly, um, they need some great advice. You cannot pay enough for good advice. And I, I also will tell you that we're looking to maybe do a uh, dental conference next year in Dallas, specifically for dentists, bring in several different speakers like your company about what the market is, how they can improve. And we've had a lot of our uh, dental clients said, hey, can you have an alternative investment conference and fight in the experts? So we'll pass that along as we get more details. We'd love to have McLaren involved, though. Yeah, that would be cool. I'd love to be involved. And I'll give out my contact info, Troy. So if anybody wants to reach out to me, you know, you can text me, call me. People say I'm crazy, but I give out my cell phone all the time. 512-660-8505. Email is Brannon, B-R-A-N-N-O-N at dentaltransitions.com. Check out our website, dentaltransitions.com. We've got a lot of resources, podcasts, articles on there that I think could be uh, very eye-opening and helpful. But I uh, appreciate you having me, Troy.